to be here today to share with you the quality and safety education for nurses and the Cusin Institute at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. My name is Mary Delansky, and I am the Sarah Hirsch Endowed Professor at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing and also the director of the Cusin Institute. Um, I love quality. Uh, I often call myself a quality improvement enthusiast. Um, for some reason, I was born with this um, ability to reflect, uh, to see gaps, and then always try to do better next time. Um, and I love to inspire students and other nurses uh, with this philosophy. Uh, is another uh, piece of work that I do is I work at the VA in Cleveland and I'm also on the national board for the VA Quality Scholars Program. And this is a two year fellowship in quality improvement where the, the fellows there, nurses, physicians, psychologists, physical therapists, pharmacists are all learning about how to improve healthcare. Um, it is both, um, uh, I guess, a clinical um, in experience, but we also do science. So we work on improvement science and implementation science there so that we can advance our knowledge of how we can get the best care delivered to patients across the, the world. So uh, my talk today will include uh, the, the Cusin Institute, and I would like to just offer that if you'd like to post something in the chat. I'm watching the chat so it can be a little dialogue, a little informal. Um, and uh, if I don't see anything there, if you also want to use the question and answer box on the Zoom, that's another way to ask something during the talk. So please, if you're thinking or having some ideas, just chat them in. Uh, I'd love to have that dialogue. We'll also do a few polls today. So to get a little um, understanding of who you are uh, on this call today. So first we have to always start with disclosures. Um, and the disclosure is, is that I have no conflict of interest um, in the planning uh, and presenting of this activity. And you will earn one hour of contact hour. Um, and to have successful completion, you have to listen and interact with the entire webinar. And then following the webinar, there will be a link to the evaluation form, uh, which will be posted in the chat box, or it will also be emailed to you. So complete and submit the evaluation within two weeks, and then you'll receive an electronic certificate to download or print for your continuing education after submitting the evaluation. Um, you can save or print your certificate, um, and you can keep your certificate for six years um, or the time frame required by your licensure board and certification renewal. And we, uh, and there is our accreditation documentation. Ah, before we begin, I just would like to reflect. The past year has been very difficult for all of us. And I want to pay tribute to all of you, nurses making a difference in our world, nurses making a difference in leadership and at the front line. If it weren't for the nurses during the COVID crisis, um, I'm not sure how we would have come out or endured as well as we have been. I also would like to just reflect and pay tribute to all of our friends and loved ones and patients who have passed during the COVID crisis. Um, it has been a very rough uh, year. So after that reflection, I would like to do a little polling question. And so I'll have Maria set up our first poll, which will be uh, what area of nursing I think do uh, you work? So I just am interested to find out if you're hospital-based or community-based or outpatient or education or maybe retired and doing preferment, doing things you prefer um, or another uh, position that you may have. All right, great. So some of you are from the hospital, about 12%, uh, community nursing, about 5%. Um, outpatient, 5%, education, 46%, uh, retired, 21%, and then um, other 18%. All right, so that gives me a good indication. Um, so possibly about half educators and then maybe 30% uh, uh, other, uh, I guess, practice-based, and then some retired uh, doing preferment, which I will enjoy soon. Next slide. Oh, there we go. 
All right. And then I'd like to just do the second poll to find out poll number two. Thank you, Maria. And what is your experience with quality and safety in your workplace? So um, that you work in a quality department, or maybe you work in risk management, or you teach quality and safety in your classes, or you don't really have a lot of experience with quality and safety. Um, and the last one would be that you integrate quality and safety into your clinical work. All right. So thank you so much for that. Just kind of looking at who we have in the audience tonight. We have uh, about 8% working in a quality department um, and then uh, a small percentage in risk management, teaching 39%. No experience, 16%, and then integrating quality and safety into clinical work, 34%. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing your situations, and that will help a little bit with this presentation moving forward. Oh, hit the wrong button. So sorry. I have to share again. There we go. All right. So uh, this is a welcome screen from the Health Education Center, which the Cusin Institute is housed. Um, we are delighted to be in this interprofessional building with our physician, our dental, and our physician assistant colleagues uh, through our work collaboratively um, and our mission in all disciplines to integrate quality and safety into our education we are really have visions for doing projects in the community related to quality and safety and doing uh, future interprofessional collaboration. So it is really um, an honor to be in this beautiful building at FPB. I also want you to know that um, I am an improver. I am uh, always thinking about how we can do things better. Um, and I have a vision that every healthcare professional will go to work to not just do their work, but to always think about how they can improve their work. Um, and I also am a believer that we need to shift our thinking or our lenses from delivering individual care to our patients, but to also taking care of the systems in which we work. So my vision is that people, our nurses and other professionals really become systems thinkers. I really uh, embrace the continuous improvement. I think it is the key to quality. And I just wanted to share that when my children were little, we did quality improvement work within our family. So we had weekly meetings and uh, we uh, co collected data and we had uh, data run charts to show how, uh, how my children were doing on their tasks that they had to do. You can see how delighted and uh, engaged they were at the time. And so when they hear teamwork, they run usually, but it was a great way to uh, raise children using the quality improvement methods. Now let's get into the uh, meat of why quality and safety is so important. And it's, I always tell my students that this is a new movement. Um, it's only really been existence since 1999 where we became aware of the issues in healthcare in quality and safety issues. Um, which was from the publication of Two Eras Human. Um, and as we move along the timeline chronologically, you can see then in 2004, there was the Patient and Safety Quality Improvement Act. Um, and then Lucian Leap Institute came into play. And in 2007, the Cusin um, movement was born. Um, at that time, also Don Barwick at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement coined the triple aim. Uh, which was um, a way for us to think about what we were striving for in healthcare, which was to have uh, better patient outcomes, to have better patient experience, and to have lower costs. This was the value of care, which was what we all were working for and toward. As we move along the continuum, you can see then that we also have the, the National Patient Safety Foundation joined with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and in 2012, the Cusin Institute uh, was born at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing when it moved from the University of North Carolina. Um, a little more on history, because I think it's important to realize the roots of why the Cusin was born. Um, and that uh, around the time of 1999, 2001, the leaders of Cusin were very concerned 
that many faculty in schools of nursing did not have the, the contemporary uh, knowledge and skill to teach their students about quality and safety. Um, and that was then, um, in, uh, I guess, synergized or sparked then by the Health Professions Education Summit by the Institute of Medicine in 2002, where they learned that um, this was a deficit in all professional education and that there was a call for physicians and dentists and pharmacists and psychologists to really integrate quality and safety competencies into their curriculums. Um, and so then we were achieving or had this vision that all professionals would develop these competencies to prepare the clinicians for this changing practice environment. So what is this changing practice environment that is so important for us to address in our educational systems? Well, if you look on the left slide here, uh, where in the past, healthcare was very hierarchical that, and um, the professions were very autonomous. Um, there was a lot of com competition between professions and very individualistic care. Um, it was expert-centered where physicians or nurses told their patients what to do. There wasn't a lot of co-partnering with patients and families. There were silos. I mean, I think we can all remember these days when um, uh, where things were very different than they are now, which we look to the right slide of this slide, where now we're more collaborative and very team-based. Um, and we really co-partner with our patients and with our communities in more service-based uh, delivery. We also now uh, hold everyone mutually accountable for outcomes, um, patients to, and, and uh, all professions. We are very patient focused um, and we integrate more education and healthcare. And now in education, we strive to demonstrate how education improves clinical outcomes, which, was, which is a very new vision in, in healthcare today. So I must always share Florence Nightingale near and dear to quality and quality improvement. She is seen in interprofessional circles as the mother of quality improvement. And that's because she collected data. She looked at the system of care. She didn't just focus in on the patient. She really was looking at the environment of care and looking at how that system supported the patient. Um, she also was, uh, um, she did a lot of experiments to see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and I think that um, her polar diagrams here are really acknowledged across the country as very innovative so that she could see the patterns in her data so that she could understand what was happening and then make improvements. And she did identify, as we all know, that the, the, the veteran or the soldiers in the Crimean War were not dying because of the infections or because of the wounds that were inflicted, but they were dying because of the infections that they acquired due to the environmental factors. Um, I must also say another uh, hero in my life is Abraham Lincoln, and that is because he um, had this tenacity and grit that uh, when he did fail, he would fail forward and learn and improve. Um, and this is the spirit of what is needed in our students for improving quality and safety, and also what is needed for our nurses in practice, that we may fail and something may not go well, but that we fail forward and always improve. So tonight, I'd like to uh, have these three areas that I'd like to cover in the next 30 minutes, um, talk a little bit about the cues in history, um, and then what we're doing currently at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at the Cusin Institute, and then opportunities for all of you to maybe uh, jump on board in our community of quality and safety enthusiasts. So I'm going to take one other poll, if you don't mind, Maria, putting in the third poll. And here I'd like to know what is your knowledge of Cusin before coming to this talk tonight? So uh, are you just hearing about are you just hearing about this for the first time? Or had you heard about it uh, but really haven't, you know, visited the website? Or have you gone to the website? Um, and then the last one is, do you integrate the cues and competencies into your education or into your practice? All right, good. So about 20 peeps, 20% 20 of you are hearing this for the first time, which is great. Thank you so much for coming to learn. 
um, heard but not been to the website about 12%, uh, visited the website about 12% and about 60% of you are really actively involved in integrating the competencies into your work in the hospital or in the community or into education. So great, thank you so much, that helps me a lot. So where, when did Cusin start? Who are these fabulous women who were leaders in identifying this gap and who, who birthed this movement? Um, and the main leader was Linda Cronenwet. Uh, she was now a living legend with the Academy. And she um, was from the, the Dean of the University of North Carolina. And she had many, many um, people working with her. Um, Gwen Sherwood, um, uh, Jane Barnsteiner and uh, many, many others. Shirley Moore was one of the people who she worked with and who pioneered this work forward. The history begins with this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funding at about $6.5 million. They really invest in nursing. Um, I just listened to the Future of Nursing report uh, yesterday uh, with Linda Burns Bolton and so inspired um, and and grateful for Robert Wood Johnson's um, trust in nursing and investment in nursing for improving patient care. Um, but back in the day in 2005, the funding um, started with phase one where the, the group of leaders developed the six competencies. They took five from the Institute of Medicine and then they also added in safety. So there are six cues and competencies. Um, and then in phase two, they launched pilot schools to really understand, well, how would a school of nursing integrate these competencies into their nursing programs? And so um, 19 schools were funded. And what they learned was that it wasn't really about like changing the structure of every course, but it was more or less about sprinkling it in, uh, getting every faculty to do, do activities that would include quality and safety. That inspired the Cusin movement to develop a teaching repository in which faculty could share their innovations in teaching with others across the nation. And I'll tell you a little bit about that soon. Um, phase three then was the development of faculty expertise. So they went around the country giving regional seminars to help faculty to learn about these competencies and also then to teach them. Um, and then the last year, 2012, there was some money given to the AACN and they developed uh, graduate Cusin regional conferences to help graduate faculty to integrate these into master's programs. But what is a competency? Um, Competency-based uh, education is, has not always been the way we've done things. Um, it is now being embraced by the American Association of Colleges of Nursing in their new re-envisioned essentials. Um, and they state that competencies um, are expectations, which when taken collectively demonstrate that what learners can do with what they know. Um, I think this is transformational um, movement in competency education. Um, it represents clear expectations that are made explicit to learners, um, also explicit to employers and the public such that we can tell um, the hospitals in our area, this is what our nursing students graduate with. These are the competencies that they have so that they can be um, uh, ready to take these new graduates and, and have them begin to provide high quality and safe care. Um, and this is not the case at this uh, juncture in our current state. Um, at the Cusin conference this year on June 2nd, we are going to highlight Joan Cavanaugh and um, her colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, where they're going to where they're going to share their measurement of competencies of new graduates and where the gaps currently are. So, if we could have these competencies both in education and practice, the bridge to having ready quality and safety ready nurses uh, would will happen. So I also want to say that the Cusin movement has inspired um, the AACN re-envisioned essentials in that the Cusin competencies are now seen in the new 10 proposed domains of the AACN essentials, uh, which is really what Linda Cronenwit always predicted, 
that the cues and competencies would be embraced by the nursing profession um, and that we would move forward on being able to demonstrate that competencies re result in um, high quality care delivery. So this is uh, one of the AAC and re-envision essentials. It's domain five, which is the quality and safety domain. Um, and in this domain, um, it really focuses on quality improvement principles in care delivery. Um, and it has two levels, one for entry into practice and then another for uh, advanced professional practice. And you can see that um, they really are highlighting qual the quality improvement uh, competency of QZIN. Here are the cues and competencies. There are six, patient-centered care, teamwork collaboration, evidence-based practice, quality improvement, safety and informatics. And we also have two levels of competencies, one pre-licensure or also applicable to nurses in practice, and then advanced practice nursing competencies. The competencies from CUSIN originated from the Institute of Medicine, uh, but the the leaders of the movement added safety and also tailored them to nursing. Uh, we are currently doing a crosswalk with our nursing competencies with medicines, quality and safety competencies, and we're seeing a lot of alignment between the two professions. Um, here's an example of one of our competencies, the quality improvement, uh, defined as using data to monitor the outcomes of care processes and using improvement methods to design and test changes to continuously improve the quality and safety of care systems. This is the competency that we, we, we will strive to graduate our BSN nurses with. And it just requires knowledge, skill, and attitudes. Notably, attitudes are so important to teach and to integrate and make sure that, our, uh, that they are present because we know that attitudes drive behavior. Um, and so we not only are giving our students knowledge, but also the attitude. Um, one, this is a picture from our CUSIN website. And these are the graduate competencies that can be seen. Um, and the website address is here. But um, if you just go to CUSIN.org, you can find all of the resources there. Um, and the competencies for both undergraduate and graduate are found in the About CUSIN on the website. I also alluded to the fact that medicine has quality and safety competencies and they published theirs in 2019 and did use the cues and competencies as a framework for building theirs. Um, one emerging area for medicine that we don't have in our cues and competencies is health equity. Um, we know, um, and the IOM um, has uh, published that health equity um, is a huge target for quality. Uh, and that these inequities must be addressed in order for us to ensure that every patient every time gets high quality and safe care. So you may say, well, why do we bother about competencies? Why do we really need them? Well, we really need them um, so that we can align interprofessional education um, and so that we can get conduct gap analyses to be able to um, look at our local curriculum and our training programs and our performance. Um, I'm going to just briefly look at the chat box because I saw a couple chats come through. Um, so I see that some people were, oh, we have some international folks here tonight from Costa Rica. Great. I know that uh, there are many international Cusinistas and Cusinestos um, in this work um, and that the Cusin competencies have been translated into four different languages. Um, and so the other uh, chats are, why did the Institute move from North Carolina to Case Western Reserve? All right, that's an excellent question. It moved to Case Western Reserve because the funding from Robert Wood Johnson ended and uh, Linda Cronenwet needed to find a home for Cusin to be sustained. Um, and it was interesting, I was at the last conference and I just saw her and I thought, oh, I'm just so passionate about quality and safety. I'm just gonna talk with her and tell her that if ever she needs any help with continuing on with this work that you know, I would step up to help out. Um, and lo and behold, 
um, because Shirley Moore was at Case Western Reserve University and I sort of raised my hand. Um, then Linda Cronenwet uh, graciously uh, transitioned Cues into Case. Uh, so that is why it is at Case Western right now um, and has been alive and well uh, for 10, almost 10 years since the transition. Um, and we are very honored to have this fine work at, uh, at Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. So back on the competencies, why do we have them? I think it's also important to have these competencies so we can um, ensure that our learning objectives align and that we can create assessment tools uh, that measure the competencies so that we can demonstrate that better competence care leads to better patient outcomes. I think this is a connection and education that we have not been able to make in the past. And I think that it is very important to do that. Um, and lastly, I think it's important for competencies because we can do research in this area and more scholarship um, in order to really show the value of nursing in healthcare delivery. Uh, this is an old slide demonstrating the historical uh, uh, the historical resource that was developed with the Robert Wood Johnson monies, and that was a teaching strategies repository. The, the, uh, the principle here was that they thought that if we could have faculty across the country submit and then have peer review for the teaching strategies that they were using and then publish them in a public format, that everybody would benefit. Um, this is the part of quality that I love is that um, in quality, we are so um, open to sharing innovative ideas and sharing our, our strategies so that uh, the patients always benefit. So that's um, the teaching strategies database. And uh, one of my last slides on the history of CUSIN is all these accomplishments that occurred under the first seven years of CUSIN under the Robert Wood Johnson funding. Um, the CUSIN Competencies were the foundation of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Nurse Residency Program. They were also the foundation of many specialty organization competencies. Uh, one particular one to highlight is the uh, Operating Room Nurses Association. They have so much cues and um, connection on their uh, website. It's very impressive. Um, and I know that with Dr. Patton, who is one of our faculty members who teaches our undergraduate students um, perioperative nursing, she integrates so many principles of quality and safety in that course. I think it's because um, nurses in surgery really need to see the system um, in, in addition to the individual care delivery of the patient. Um, a third contribution of the cues and competencies was with the undergraduate and graduate AA essentials. And as I mentioned, now with the re-envisioned essentials, um, it also was integrated in textbooks um, and also integrated into the NCLEX, which um, really helps with the sustainability of this movement. Historically, many articles were published and many books were published and books continue to be published with the cues and uh, quality and safety um, for nurses. Um, foundation. Um, the last historical piece I want to share is the VA, and that's um, an important part of our connection because um, I currently um, lead in the VA Quality Scholars Program at the national level, and this program was funded by the Cusin Robert Wood Johnson funded um, foundation grant money. Um, the vision was that we need scholars, we need um, scientists, and um, nurses in the field who are leading and understanding improvement. Um, and so the VA Quality Scholar trains these leaders. It's interprofessional um, where we have physicians, doctorally trained nurses, psychologists, pharmacists, and um, other disciplines. It, the VA Quality Scholar program started in 1998, but it was only physicians. And then in 2009, 2009, then that's when the nurses came in because of the RWJF cues and funding. And this really actually was Shirley Moore's vision um, that we would develop uh, nurse scholars and scientists uh, focused on improvement science. How can we advance the uh, knowledge that we have to improve care delivery for our patients? There are 12 sites for our VA Quality Scholars Program, and we currently have 50 interprofessional fellows. Um, and it is a very impressive program. 
um, particularly for um, our pre-doctoral and postdoctoral students. So in nursing, we can in, include DNPs or PhDs. And what we found is that the synergy and work between the DNP who's clinically focused and our PhD who is more um, research focused can accelerate our knowledge and understanding. Um, the VA graduates fellows in many different domains. Um, we, we, we graduate leaders, scholars, educators, and then investigators. So it's a really fabulous program, uh, a two-year fellowship for our nurses. Okay, so that was the history of CUSIN. So the 20% of you who didn't know anything about it, I hope that has uh, given you the information that you need and makes you more curious to, to wonder what we're doing now. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we have our current CUSIN transition in 2012 and the mission we changed a little bit to state that the CUSIN Institute is a collaborative of healthcare professionals focused in education, practice, and scholarship to improve quality and safety. We knew that things needed to be interprofessional in 2012 and that that needed to be part of our mission. Um, and our vision is to inspire healthcare professionals to put quality and safety as a core value to guide the work. Again, that attitude component that is so essential. Um, and what do we do now? Well, we're trying to inspire a community, a community of fellow nurses who are passionate about quality and safety and willing to develop strategies and science in how we can do better. We have a website and a conference. So that are the two main um, uh, ways that we spread our vision. The CUSIN website and uh, the conference is uh, currently in, um, is currently evolving. The conference is virtual, like all our conferences are now. And the conference platform is open from January 1st to June 30th. Uh, we have three live sessions, one we just finished in January. Uh, we have another live session April 9th and um, then a third one in June 2nd. And again, we're delighted to focus on academic practice partnerships for quality and safety because our um, CUSIN is both academia and practice now. Knowingly, we need to work together collaboratively to improve patient care. We also uh, support task forces, but we're calling them now catalysts for change communities. Uh, we want to really see quality and safety in a positive way, um, instead of looking at as gaps and deficits. Um, and here are some of our task force um, that have from anywhere between 10 members to 60 members who get together and identify projects um, and identify uh, publications and ways to lead the movement in these specific topical areas. So for example, our academic task force has done multi-site studies across the country in schools of nursing, testing the impact of some of the cues and teaching strategies. Another spread strategy that we started in 2012 were regional centers. And we did have uh, three colleges that were interested. Uh, the University of North Carolina wanted to continue on as a regional center. And then we also have Jacksonville University um, who has currently started a master's degree in quality and safety. And then the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, we've also um, supported the development of some a massive open online course, Take the Lead on Healthcare Quality Improvement, which is a free resource for any nurse or student across the country to do a quality improvement project. And we also um, have expanded our teaching strategies repository to practice strategies to provide the opportunity for individuals in practice settings to share their efforts in implementing cues and competencies. Um, and we have a wonderful partnership with the Net Nursing Alliance for Quality Care that is a sub, 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 sub committee or sub organization of the American Nurses Association. Ah, and here I pause to uh, share with you one um, contribution that Case Western has given to CUSIN, and that is systems thinking. Um, Shirley Moore really inspired me as a, a young scientist to really think about this concept of systems thinking 
um, where we not only deliver vigilant individual care, but we also deliver as nurses vigilant systems of care. And that means that we take care of our system in addition to taking care of our patient, um, which is really what Florence Nightingale was doing um, and really what is needed in quality improvement. And we did publish an, an article about this. We were funded uh, by the Robert Wood Johnson um, in the early days and developed a systems thinking um, scale so that we could measure this concept. Um, and there have been several publications of using this tool. Um, it has been translated into 10 languages um, and also um, has been used to demonstrate the impact of systems thinking on patient outcomes. And because I'm, you know, I really think that this is a paradigm shift for us in education and in practice that we need to have the nurses really have lenses that go from personal care delivery to the systems care delivery. Here's just an example to kind of share our ideas. Um, and I think traditionally nurses really work at the personal effort uh, level where, you know, when we try to prevent pressure injury, we have many evidence-based strategies that we we apply to our patients where we turn them and we um, can communicate to others what the need of that patient is. But as we move to the continuum to the right and become more systems thinkers, um, the nurse at the bedside starts to inquire about, well, what are other nurses doing to prevent ulcers or pressure injuries for their patients? And um, wondering what is our data? How many of our patients on our unit have pressure injuries? And then have that nurse then even compare or to think further about what um, is the ulcer rate on our unit compared to other units or other hospitals. So this systems lens is really important in this quality and safety movement. Um, I also wanted to just share a couple of publications that were, we are focused on. And one is the uh, implementation science of uh, in integrating quality and safety education for nurses' competencies and nursing education. Um, and then also, I also wanted to share this article, a practice application of how the cues and competencies align with the Joint Commission and the American Nurses Credentialing Center or the magnet competencies. Um, and there is a strong alignment of the work of the Joint Commission and the magnet with CUSIN. Um, and then notably, I want to just pay tribute to a colleague who uh, really um, pioneered our work with cues and competencies in practice, and that was Krista Kofel. Um, she um, had many grants in academic practice partnerships for the cues and competencies. She led our American Nurses Association pre-conference with cues and, and practice alignment, um, and she had she developed this model, which is very hard to see. So what I did was take out a piece of her main contribution here. Oh, and that is, if you can see down below here, she, dem she gave us tools for how we could implement the cues and, the cues and competencies into our and job descriptions, annual performance reviews, clinical ladder programs, um, onboarding orientation, residency programs, and preceptor programs. Um, and really made a huge impact into um, the, the application of cues and competencies into practice. Another highlight here of what's currently being done with cues and is uh, one of our pilot schools leaders was Gail Armstrong out of the University of North of uh, Colorado. And she now recently published this book about leadership and systems improvement for the DNP, aligning the cues and competencies in the DNP uh, curriculum. Okay, so before I go on, I'm just going to look at the chat again and just see if there were any questions so far. And it looks like, um, one moment. Could you explain the difference between evidence-based practice and implementation science? Yes, I can. Um, and I'll, uh, I, I, I really am passionate about this topic also. Um, they are aligned. Um, the evidence-based practice uh, movement is huge, as we all know, in practice and in education, in that we all believe as nurses that our interventions need to be, or if we know the evidence, that we should implement them. Where implementation science uh, enters the uh, door is that 
um, in Dr. Melnick's work where she has you do the PICO question and the evidence review, um, and then coming to you know what the conclusion is about what the evidence needs to be Im implemented. Um, implementation science then guides us in taking that and getting it implemented into practice. So um, it's been um, um, another contribution to science for the past maybe 20, 25 years. Um, I'd say that probably in the past 10 years, it's taken on greater um, enthusiasm by the NIH and the um, AHRQ for funding implementation um, research. Um, and when we study implementation, what we're looking at is what strategies will help us to ensure that that evidence is delivered at, to every patient every time. Um, and so there's theories in implementation science to guide this work. There are many strategies that have um, evidence to show that they will impact that uptake of the evidence into practice. Um, and it is a really open area for nursing scientists. Um, so with my work with the Hearst Center at the university, uh, we are now incorporating that into our PhD curriculum um, and uh, supporting students in um, submitting grants in that area. So I hope that helps with that piece. Um, good question. And the other question was, um, you mentioned that QZ competencies are focused on pre-licensure BSN nurses. How do the competencies overlay and allow diploma? Great question. Um, and associate degree nurses, that's a really great question. Well, I think that the associate's degree um, uh, programs can't integrate everything. So I think that they do focus on the QZ competencies to a degree, um, but to, to um, to, but it's difficult for them to address them all. And I actually haven't seen like um, an article demonstrating that, but that would be a really great publication to demonstrate uh, where, where is that transition from the associate degree, the, the baccalaureate degree that contributes to the cues and competencies. Um, and the next question was, as a nurse educator, I was very active with cues and both in the classroom and working with our practice settings. Since I have now been retired for six years, how can I continue to be active? Just wait, we'll get to that. And Denise Reese wrote, wrote we built our A associates curriculum on cues and, and used the Delphi study for our KSAs and leveling of skills. Are those still current and are there any plans to revisit these? Okay, well, looks like uh, Denise Reese could be one of our experts in the associate's degree application and we'll have to connect on that, Denise, and work on that a bit. Um, and then our nursing specialty groups besides ARN already mentioned working to integrate CUSIN into their practice and certification exams. Um, I know of a few of them, um, but... Um, I don't have them at the top of my uh, memory, which exactly ones they are. I know that we talked with the critical care nurses and aligned the cues and competencies with their work, and there is a strong alignment there. Um, and we also talked to the uh, oncology nurses, and they also have a strong alignment with the cues and competencies. Um, so there are um, really, those are great examples of big nursing organizations that integrate them. So great questions, and thank you for the dialogue. All right, so I also wanted to highlight one of our DNP students, Mary jo Dr. Mary Jo Kravanek, um, who I was one of her mentors, where she uh, took the um, implementation frameworks um, and implemented team steps to facilitate workplace civility and nurse retention, um, demonstrating uh, the, the cues and competency of teamwork and collaboration and how then we implement that into practice and get some great clinical outcomes from that. All right, so cuesin.org, that's the place to go for more information. Um, and we are still growing strong. We have about uh, 200,000 users per year. We have a great return rate and a lot of new visitors. And we average about uh, 900 to 1,000 users on our website a day. So it is a very active website with a lot of great resources. So this is a movement. I know it's been going now. Um, for um, you know, many, many years, um, but it will continue because there are still many gaps in quality and safety in healthcare. So we have momentum and we're hoping then now for opportunities for all of you. 
uh, because nurses make the difference in quality and safety, and we need more leaders like all of you to uh, help in this movement. Um, I also just wanted to briefly talk about COVID and how it impacted the work of QZIM or the work of quality and safety and education and practice. And COVID has challenged us in our infrastructures with uh, personal protective equipment, with staffing levels that are low and nurses being um, required to work um, harder, um, the need and shift to, to telehealth and how does that impact the quality and safety of our patients? Um, also the shift to community and how there are many health inequities and um, social determinants of health that need to be addressed. Um, and then many work demands uh, that our, the COVID has put onto us. But nurses have responded and the QZIN competencies have helped because with QZIN, we are innovators. We are always thinking about how can we do it better? Um, with QZIN, we're learning quickly. We do and we know how to do quality improvement and rapid cycle plan, do, study, acts. With QZIN, we're interprofessionally focused so we can work in teams and understand the views of others and share our views and really move the patient care forward in more positive ways. With QSIN, we're focused on safety and ensuring that when we do have to shift our care delivery, that we are always putting the patient and safety at the core. And the big part about the COVID is it's really inspired nurses to use informatics and technology in ways we never dreamed we would. So QSIN and our nurses have courage and grit to make our patient care better. So I encourage you to join the movement. If you wanna email me after this talk, um, I would really in, uh, love to have a conversation with you to learn about you and learn where maybe would might be some opportunities for you. Um, and uh, some other activities that you can get involved in would be to attend the virtual 2021 conference. Um, again, we have some great keynotes, um, Dr. Uh, Kavanaugh from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and Pat Sharpnick from Ursuline, they're gonna be talking about their work collaboratively with academic practice partnerships. Um, we also have Marilyn Orman from Nurse Educator in the Journal of Nursing Care Quality, who's gonna talk about how do you publish and spread the, spread the great work that you're doing about quality and safety. Um, and then we also have uh, Regina Cunningham from the University of Pennsylvania and their hospital system has implemented the cues and competencies throughout their um, organizations and have demonstrated that the competencies have improved clinical outcomes. So I'm really excited to hear their work there at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you can also join a task force. Um, and as I mentioned, the task forces have either, you know, anywhere from 10 members to 120 members. Um, and that is the academic practice the academic task force. Um, but these task forces are a great way to meet people who are like-minded. Um, the task force members, they are so inspiring to me because they make friendships. Um, and when I see them at the conferences, um, they're just, it's just a delight to see, um, you know, like-minded people enjoy and work and uh, focus on improving quality and safe care for our patients. And the other uh, third thing you can do to get active in QZIN is to submit a teaching or a practice strategy. Um, the uh, database or the repository, the directions are there. They are peer reviewed. Um, so we have double peer review on the, the applications or the submissions, um, and then they get published. And um, you can see how often these strategies get used by other nurses. It is quite amazing. Um, I was doing um, a class preparation this semester. I'm teaching quality improvement and leadership to our MN students. And um, I needed to teach them about uh, clinical practice guidelines. Oh, I'm sorry, clinical guidelines and how important those are in the evidence-based practice continuum for implementation. And I was like, oh, I just didn't want to make, you know, like have to make it all up myself. So I went to the QZIN website and in the search bar, I put clinical practice guidelines, and lo and behold, a great strategy came up. I took the PowerPoint, I plugged it in my Canvas site, I, you know, I gave the, the colleague uh, the credit for it, and I used all her debriefing questions for that strategy, and it saved me a ton amount of time. 
So those that repository is really, really helpful for education. We just started it in practice. So I think we only have uh, two or three practice strategies so far, but we're hoping that we can energize it. Um, and these practice strategies will be useful for staff, staff nurses in magnet hospitals or staff nurses and leaders in hospitals that are trying to attain magnet or pathway to excellence. So here's a little picture from our website with the teaching and practice strategies looks for looks like. And you can see here, um, there's submission guidelines and uh, where you submit. So it's really user-friendly. Again, at cusin.org. So I'm really excited to be a part of this movement. Uh, we are changing a culture in nursing um, and in other professionals um, education and in, in, in healthcare delivery. We're moving from implementing quality and safety competencies now to really um, to a philosophy of learning and improving. Many of the hospitals are becoming learning organizations where this is just becoming a part of the fabric of the staff, where um, the health the professionals, the providers and nurses and physicians are all thinking, how do we improve? How do we, how do we fill this gap? You know, looking at the system, looking at the gaps and then making improvements. So that's very exciting times I think we're living in. Um, so, um, this is the end of my presentation. Um, I covered the cues in history, the, what we are currently doing at the Francis Payne Bolton for the past 10 years from 2012 to now, um, and then opportunities for all of you to possibly um, get involved in this movement forward. Um, and one of the quotes from Margaret Wheatley that I really love and embrace is that real change does not come from decree or pressure, permission or persuasion. Real change comes from people who are passionately and personally committed to a decision or direction that they help to shape. So I encourage you to uh, join in this great movement that we have. I'm just gonna just mention that there is in the chat box, the link for the evaluation for this. And I will also look at the quality of the, the question and answer tab here to make sure I have all the questions answered. Um, one question by Megan was, can you share an example of how we might be able to advocate for greater adoption of cues and competencies into the culture of nursing care on an individual unit level? Okay, well, that's a great question, Megan. Um, I think that, again, as we learned with the, the early work of cues in, in implementing the competencies into education, the sprinkling of it. And so, there doesn't need to be a, re, um, a redo of the performance evaluations, which would work, right? If you change your performance evaluations on your unit or in your hospital that aligned with CUSIN, then that's going to really drive the, the integration. But on a specific unit, you can do um, take a competency and think about uh, where are we with this competency on our unit? And what are some things we can do to increase um, our nurses um, competence in this area. So for example, teamwork and that um, in that article I displayed, those nurses on that unit identified that teamwork was not going well at all. There was a lot of incivility. And so then they just took um, one of the competencies from the CUSIN framework and then implemented the team steps to see if that might improve. So it's um, the way to do this is, is taking it by chunk um, and sprinkling in some wins so that your staff and your unit can see that, that uh, the integration of the competencies can, re uh, can result in uh, more joy in work and then also better patient outcomes. And so celebrate those wins to show your staff nurses and your colleagues that the, the focus on this integration really can improve patient care. And again, you can implement some very simple things like huddles um, or maybe a, a small journal club, you know, on your unit to just talk about these issues. Or maybe you can just do um, some data collection and identify where your gaps are on your unit and then show those gaps. And I know that a lot of hospitals do the NDNQI uh, quality indicators, but maybe there's other quality issues that are there that maybe need to be highlighted in addition to the ND and QI. All right, so then another question was, the link to the eval is not showing in my chat box. Hmm. 
All right. So that's Maria. So Maria, if you can make sure if you want to post it again, because sometimes it does squirrel up in the chat box. And here she posted the link again. Sorry about that. All right. She fixed the evaluation. So good. You guys are using it. All right. So now I'm just going to check the quality. The, I'm sorry. <laughs> See, quality is at the core of my being. The question and answer cue. Here's a question from Mary. As a nurse educator, I was very active with cues in both in the classroom and working with our practice settings. Since I have now been retired, oh, I talked, I did answer that one. I hope, Mary, I gave you some great ideas on how you can be active in cues. In. All right. Uh, I think I answered Denise's. Uh, let's see. Yep. And the other question was the evaluation. <sighs> well, this was so exciting to be with you all tonight and to share uh, the quality and safety education for nurses or cues and Institute at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. And I'm so excited. Um, hopefully I'll hear from some of you. My email is mad15 at case.edu. Um, and so if you want to send me an email, if, um, or if you'd like to uh, learn more, happy to have a conversation. Um, and Maria will also be sending out an email to all of you and the evaluation link will be in that email also. So if, it, if you weren't able to get it from the chat, you will be getting an email shortly. All right. Thank you all. That ends our session tonight. And have a wonderful evening to quality and safety and beyond. Thank you.